This is an HBO Sports production of a Bob Arum and Don King heavyweight doubleheader. The last time these two arch rivals co-promoted a fight was the Leonard Duran No Mas rematch in 1980. Tonight's feature attraction is a 23-year-old former heavyweight champion, Mike Tyson. Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada, where first tonight, you'll see a heavyweight fight in the never-ending comeback of George Foreman as he takes on his first top 10 opponent, Adelson Rodriguez. That bout is scheduled for 10 rounds. Then, former heavyweight champion Mike Tyson returns to the ring to face an old nemesis, Henry Tillman. That, too, a fight scheduled for 10 rounds. We are in the outdoor arena at Caesars, where so many major events have taken place in years past. Duran, Leonard, Hagler, Hearns, Holmes, all the great champions of the 1980s fought at this historic site. Ironically, two have, who have not performed on the outdoor stage at Caesars are Tyson and Foreman. And tonight, for the first time, this arena opens up in a carnival atmosphere for two non-title fights. The eyes of the world, nevertheless, focus here on this ring and on two heavyweight fighters as they try to resurrect their careers. Hello again, I'm Jim Lampley, and we welcome you here for a heavyweight doubleheader which says a great deal, pro or con, as you may choose, as to the state of affairs in boxing's heavyweight division. And on a weekend when the NBA playoffs are no longer ongoing, and when many of you sports fans might be looking for something a little more pulse-quickening than 18-hole coverage of golf, a little bit higher scoring than World Cup soccer? Well, here we are. The last time we came to the outdoor arena here at Caesars, it was a year ago to watch Sugar Ray Leonard in his second battle against Tommy Hearns. Tonight, Sugar Ray wears a tuxedo and works with us. And we look at Mike Tyson up the road a little bit, Sugar Ray. What is it that he will be looking to find out about himself tonight? Well, the loss that Mike Tyson suffered at the hands of Jane Buster Douglas was not just a physical loss, but an emotional loss. Who was to blame? Mike Tyson his corner? That's the big question. So. It really doesn't matter who he's facing tonight. I think this is just a reassurance for Mike Tyson himself to see what's left. So despite the fact that uh, Henry Tillman is not regarded by many as a worthy opponent, odds flirting right now at about the 17 to 18 to 1 level, you think there's still something to be gained for Mike? For Mike Tyson, the opponent is irrelevant, although from a promoter standpoint, you want someone of name. But this is a big question that needs to be answered for Mike Tyson. And those questions will be answered in the second bout of the evening. But the first bout, a little bit of perhaps more comic fare involving the Falstaffian character of George Foreman. What do you want to do next? What is the next step in this brilliant campaign of yours? I hope to think that maybe the winner of this fight tonight and the winner of the next fight with Mike Tyson and Tillman, that they'll match us both together. I think the people really deserve to see a true heavyweight fight now. If the scenario unfolds with Holyfield fighting Douglas in the fall, and then perhaps one of them wants to fight you, is that okay with George Foreman to fight one of them for the heavyweight title? I would sure love that. That's the ultimate goal, to fight for the heavyweight championship of the world. When I do that then, I can go back and uh, be a good former and whip up my children. They beat me up now because I can't hit them. They whipping me up. But if I can get that over, I'll just wrestle with my little boys and play basketball and things of that nature. Just one more thing I want the folks out there to hear from your lips, George. You've got three sons named George. Yeah, George, George the first, George the second, George the third. Now I, explain I, 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 why. I'm daddy, then there's George Jr., there's Monk and Big Will, and I love them all, but I didn't want one of them to have a great name, and, I, and the other would say, why didn't you name me dad? So I decided, decided to start a tribe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe a George the fourth is on the way too. And, so and now we're back on the way back to ringside and Jim and Ray. Well, Ray Leonard only has one son named Ray, but he has plenty of other credentials to discuss what he just saw. I suppose you'd have to suspect that a few less people are laughing at George Foreman now than was the case 20 minutes ago. You know what George Foreman is actually doing in America? He's, he's creating markability and credibility. Forget about who he's fighting. 
in the fashion that he's able to knock away and do away with his opponents, people start to believe in George Foreman. Should there be any trepidation at all about the fact that George is 41 years old? Does he really stand to get hurt if he goes up against a Mike Tyson or a Buster Douglas or an Evander Holyfield? I think someone needs to ask Archibald that same question. Age is not, age is in the mind, and I think as long as you take care of your body, George apparently has been preserving his body and his weight, but George does a tremendous job. I'm very impressed. Does he look to you to be the hardest hitter in the heavyweight division? No, I still think Mike Tyson busts Ducks ranks up there as far as the heavy hitters. But again, Jim, it's deceptive. It doesn't appear like George is hitting hard, but once he hits the guy, he totally paralyzes his opponents. Well, let's take a look back at second round action, and we'll take a look at the series of punches that led to the knockout. Well, when George Foreman lands a punch, like it's a grazing right hand, and then he comes back with left hook. That was a lot of power there because he had his whole body 263 pounds behind that. George Foreman is a big puncher, and uh, it's very hard to gauge whether or not he's the same punch he was as a, as a champion. But here, when he hits his guys, they stand still and they drop. Let's clarify something you said a few moments ago before we went up to Larry for the ring uh, interview. I think I heard you say that you think George is better when he's lighter, more accurate, more effective with his punches when he's lighter. Did you mean to say better when he's heavier? Well, I, well he's proven to be wrong. I think George is quicker when he's lighter. It proved against Jerry Cooney. He threw more punches, combinations, and the accuracy was there. As he gets heavier, he's a little more lethargic, but he's still effective. But I prefer to see a lighter George Foreman if he should face a Mike Tyson. Indeed, he was about 10 pounds lighter against Cooney than was the case tonight at 263 pounds. And right now, for a look ahead to what might happen in the heavyweight division in the wake of this second round Foreman knockout of Rodriguez, here is Larry Merchant. Hi, I'm here with those two lovebirds, Don King and Bob Arum, and also with Mr. Henry Gluck, who's the chairman of the Board of Caesars. Let me ask you fellas, what do you have planned for Big George next? Well, I think before we talk yeah. about that, I think uh, Henry Gluck has a real momentous announcement that he'd like to make, and then we'll come back come to back us. Up. Okay, Henry, what is your momentous announcement? Well, first of all, it, the momentous announcement, first of all, is to have Don and uh, Bob and Tyson and Foreman all in the ring at the same time. But what they're referring to is uh, we're Cosmo International, big multi-divisional, multi-international firm is building a huge resort, and we're going to be managing that with a Jack Nicholas designed 27-hole golf course, and it'll be a Caesars Canyon resort and a Caesars Canyon golf course with a tennis center for 2,000 seats and uh, many, many attractions. We're very proud of that, and it's a big evening for us in this first round. Thank you, and you thought we didn't have commercials on HBO. <laughs> well, you understand, because this really leads in to what we're going to do. If Mike comes through his fight that's coming up. A very small if. if well, I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Before. Right. But he's yeah. going to be ready. Right. He's going to be ready. Then what we'd like to do is to come back here in September and do it again. Another doubleheader with George against uh, uh, a top ten opponent and uh, Mike against a top ten opponent. We'd like to do it here at Caesars Palace because it's truly the home of champions. Uh, Don, in the event that the uh, Douglas Holyfield fight comes over, comes off at a hotel in this area, and you happen to be a part of that promotion, does this mean that your love affair with Bob will be brief and over? Absolutely not. I think that what Bob and I are doing now is finding out that working together works and establishing a dialogue and communication that enables us to find out what our weaknesses and strengths are and we couple complement each other's strengths and, and have strongly help uh, support the weaknesses all right, so we keep working together all right explain in your words in 10,000 words or less of eight syllables or less what is the phenomenon of george foreman George Foreman is like a Rip Van Winkle fight. He went to sleep for 10 years, and out of that hiatus, George has come back awesome and devastating, more so than he was before, because now he has a personality to go along with the devastation and the power that he had wreaked before when he was wreaking havoc in the heavyweight division. George is, a, is a, something that makes every man over 40 uh, have a vicarious pleasure in saying that life begins at 40, and he's the true personification of it. How would a Harvard man put it, Bob? George Foreman, simply put, is the best heavyweight in the world. I don't care if he's 42. I don't care if he's 22. He is the best heavyweight in the world. Now, that's and the question that, on that. That's yeah. the one thing okay. that we don't agree okay. on, but we said they that's got a good. chance to find I'll out. That's what we can together and settle it. But 
Also, he's come back such a wonderful person. His humanity, his decency shines through, and that's what enamors him to the public. Not only is he a great, great fighter, but he is a wonderful, wonderful person, a warm human being, and I think everybody out there in America sees that. Thank you, gentlemen. Do you two guys at ringside see that? <laughs> well, my first question to Ray is, can anything good come to boxing as a result of Bob Arum and Don King working together? Does that uh, put you at pause just a little bit? The resurrection of George Foreman makes boxing a lot nicer and more acceptable. George Foreman is a breath of fresh air. I want to say that. All right, and you give credit to Aram and King for having created the circumstances under which George can be seen in this particular forum, I take it. George Foreman is a breath of fresh air. <laughs> Ever the diplomat, Ray Leonard, <laughs> who does his boxing deals through an independent authority, Mike Trainer. Well, Mr. Aram claims that George is the best heavyweight alive. Do you think he really believes that? Well, I guess by promoting the George Foreman fight, I mean, what, what should he say? But uh, it's yet to be seen. I mean, you got Buster Douglas. He's a champion. They must beat Buster Douglas first before someone we'll make that claim. There's considerable talk, of course, that the September doubleheader that uh, Aram and King referred to there, which would match Foreman and Tyson once again against a pair of opponents here, is designed by its scheduling to take the thunder away from the now-signed heavyweight championship fight scheduled for September 20 at the Mirage between Buster Douglas, the champion, and Evander Holyfield, the number one contender. What will the public be more interested in? Another Tyson Foreman doubleheader, assuming that Mike gets past Henry Tillman tonight, or the heavyweight championship bout between Douglas and Holyfield? I think the anticipation relies upon this fight tonight with Mike Tyson. What the intrigue is, what's left for Mike Tyson? Does he have anything left? Is there a new Mike Tyson? That's the big question, Jim. I think people are not going to jump ahead until they see what Mike Tyson does tonight. Of course, the quote from Seth Abraham, vice president for acquisition of boxing properties here at HBO Sports, is that we have right here in the persons of Tyson and Foreman, the only two heavyweights who sell tickets. Douglas and Holyfield are apparently going to get the chance to disprove that notion through some marketing of their own. This is a fight, nevertheless, which has attracted a great deal of attention, or at least this doubleheader has attracted a great deal of attention from the celebrities who often populate the boxing world. Billy Crystal here tonight. You see Michael Douglas sitting near the ring, and I saw earlier Jeff Goldblum and his wife, Gina Davis, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, entered the ring environment tonight in the Tyson entourage and in the company of Don King, Chuck Norris, Jack Nicholson, a regular habitué of these fights, and surely it's got to make Tyson and Foreman feel good as aspiring champions rather than title holders to see all those folks here. Well, the fact of the matter is, when these guys fight, it's an event, and that's why you have these celebrities turn out. Continue the event. Let's go back to Larry Merchant. Gentlemen, now I'm surrounded some, by some prize fighters, some pretty good prize fighters. James Buster Douglas, the heavyweight champion of the world. Buster, give us your quick analysis of George Foreman. Do you think he's a real contender, or is he just some kind of a joke being put over the public? No, I wouldn't uh, say that he's a, uh, a joke by no means. I think he's a worthy contender. You know, he's been out there for some two years now on his comeback trail, and um, he's, he's been winning. Nobody has defeated him, so you would have to consider him as a contender. If you were to fight Evander Holyfield in the fall and uh, successfully defend your title, would you consider fighting him before you went back to Tyson? Uh, no, those are no, those are not in my plans at the present time. Uh, my plans are to fight Evander, defend it against Evander, and then in turn uh, give Tyson a rematch. Now you look a little bit beefier than you were in Tokyo. You haven't fought in four months. I don't know if you've been doing any gym work. How much do you weigh, and when do you start going back to the gym? Well, I opened up gym officially in Columbus, Ohio, at Fitness Trend Health Spa, uh, the first uh, Monday in uh, June. Uh, but uh, I'm right now, I'm carrying about 242 pounds, which is not too bad. And that's about my natural weight, you know, before a fight. So I just have I figure around 15 pounds to take off to be prepared to fight in September. Thank you very much, Buster. And now, Evander Holyfield. Evander, presumably you're going to fight this man in, in September, but first, uh, you've made some news in the last day or so. Uh, you've announced that you're separating yourself from Ken Sanders, your, your manager who had been with you since your amateur days. What's that story about? Well, I felt that it was a good business decision for me to go on without him. 
because I felt that he wasn't working in the best of my interest. So we had a, you know, so we depart in a, in a good manner. Will he share in your jackpot for fighting Douglas? Yes, I feel that he deserved uh, his share. He'd been with me and he had advised me well in the time. Your quick assessment of George Foreman. You stopped Rodriguez in the second round also. What did you see out there? Do you consider him a real contender? Yes, I do consider him as a contender. He's been out there. He fought 22 fights now. He won them all. He just fought Allison Rodriguez, was the first uh, top 10 opponent. And he went out there and did it in good fashion. You can't take that from him. Well, let me ask you the same question I asked Buster. If you should win the heavyweight championship in the fall, would you go after Foreman, who you might consider an easy opponent for a lot of money, before you defended against Tyson? No, I, I would fight the number one contender. Um, I feel that uh, Tyson is Tyson still the number one contender, and he deserves a shot. Thank you, Evander. Now to you, Jim. Ahead to September 2nd, who do you favor in Douglas Holyfield? Well, I think with Buster Douglas coming off that amazing win over Mike Tyson, he has the edge. He's bigger, he's stronger, and uh, I'll give him the edge. All right, that's another story, and we'll take care of that one in September. Meanwhile, on this night, we have finished with Chapter 1. And now we turn our attention to the darker mysteries involved in Chapter 2. For a look at what lies ahead for young Mike Tyson, it might be instructive first to look back. comeback weaves an unforgettable thread through heavyweight history. Jack Dempsey was an inactive champion for a three-year period when in 1926 he met a 3-1 underdog named Gene Tunney. The slick challenger outboxed Dempsey over 10 rounds and the title was lost. One year later, after one tune-up for Dempsey, the rematch in Chicago, Dempsey dropped Tunney in the seventh, but the long count saved the champion. Tunney knocked down Dempsey in the eighth, en route to a 10-round decision. Dempsey refused a third fight and retired in 1928. In 1936, Joe Lewis, a 22-year-old heavyweight contender, fought former champion Max Schmeling. The Brown Bomber was knocked down in the fourth and out in the twelfth. The meteoric rise of Joe Lewis was derailed. But after he won the title, Lewis's fourth defense was against that same Max Schmeling. After three vicious knockdowns, it was stopped at 204 of the first round. Joe Lewis held the championship for 12 years. Heavyweight champion Floyd Patterson fought a 3-1 underdog Swede, Ingemar Johansson. The champion went down seven times in the third round. At age 24, Floyd Patterson had lost the title, but not for very long. One year later, with a lightning left hook in the fifth, Patterson became the first heavyweight champion ever to regain the title. Sonny Liston, after two one-round knockouts of Patterson, fought an eight-to-one underdog named Cassius Marcellus Clay. Clay outboxed the bear as Liston failed to answer the bell for round eight. Fifteen months later, the mysterious rematch. Liston down from a phantom right in the first round. In 1970, in Las Vegas, Liston died of a drug overdose. Ali went on to win the heavyweight title a record three times. Which brings us to Mike Tyson and his monumental upset loss to James Buster Douglas. Douglas coming back with a look at right. Tyson is wobbling. What an uppercut by Douglas. Right down goes Tyson. The night's big question, can Tyson come back? Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada, where former heavyweight champion Mike Tyson returns to the ring to face Henry Tillman. It's scheduled for 10 rounds. So many great heavyweight champions have lost that title. Now Tyson takes the lonely journey back into the ring after his crushing loss in February. 
What does the future hold for this once invincible force? Tonight in this historic setting, and in front of an enthusiastic boxing crowd, we begin to get some of the answers. Ray Leonard, Mike Tyson is a student of history. He well knows that all of the great heavyweight champions, with the sole exception of Rocky Marciano, have lost at one time or another. How much consolation is that to him? Well, if there's any guy that doesn't need motivation, it's Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson is like a, a walking boxing library. I mean, he knows about these guys' history. He knows how many guys have regained their titles. So Mike Tyson wants to be in there with that elite group. So I'm sure he's already motivated for that. He's also one of the most entertaining figures in sport, regardless of whether you like him or not. Because Mike Tyson's life is so densely rich with circumstances and events that it's become our custom between each of his appearances in the ring to chronologue those battles he takes on outside the ring. The period between February 10 and now has only continued the tradition. February 10, 1990. For fight fans, a night to remember. For one fighter, a night to forget. Undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, Iron Mike Tyson, the challenger, James Buster Douglas. Another right hand, and now Tyson seems to be wobbling. Mike is not throwing back. Buster Douglas is completely dominating this round with jabs and right crosses. I wouldn't focus on fight. I didn't apply myself. And then the right hand uppercut and down goes Douglas. As suddenly as that. Can he beat the count? He got a little overconfident. As far as the count was concerned, I thought definitely that the fight was over. Beginning, you have so much life, you have so much to give to the world, you have so much to offer, and you want to offer to everyone, you want to show and prove. And then after a while, you know what I mean, you, know, you take it for granted, and, you, and, everything, and you try to do everything. If you can't fight, it's useless. Many great heavyweight champions have lost the title. A precious few have fought their way back to the top. Mike Tyson likes to quote reggae singer Ziggy Marley, who said, you don't realize you're making history because you're living it. of history when last Mike Tyson and Henry Tillman met here at Caesars Palace in the indoor arena six years ago it was to determine who would go to the Olympic Games Tillman won that trip Tyson earned a trip back to the Catskills compound of custom auto so much has changed since then now they prepare to meet under entirely different circumstances as HBO Sports brings you the second of our heavyweight doubleheader on this evening, Mike Tyson against Henry Tillman in about scheduled for 10 rounds. Tyson's return to the ring, and we return to Larry Merchant. Youngest heavyweight champion, youngest ex-heavyweight champion. The philosopher George Foreman explained it this way. Mike Tyson runs into every wall he sees, meaning if there's a chance to make a mistake, he's made it, seized it embraced it. But that, of course, is the perspective of maturity. Remember, we all embraced Mike Tyson. We loved him for his youthful aggressiveness, for his exuberance, at least until it turned self-defeating, self-destructive. Well, it then became uh, the fight in Tokyo happened after that, and what that was was the gods delivering a message to him in the name and in the person of James Buster Douglas an unlikely messenger at that. Mike Tyson now says that that Mike Tyson is dead, buried in Tokyo. Is he? We'll see. But the question of whether he's one of those seemingly invincible fighters who stays down when he goes down or who gets up won't be answered tonight. He has made a small step by rededicating himself. 
but he's taking no chances in his opponent, Henry Tillman. The Watts Riots, 1965. Anarchy in the streets. This was Henry Tillman's playground. I was scraped from the bottom of the pan, from just a, a juvenile delinquent in a youth authority in California, uh, born and raised in, the, in Watts, come from, you know, basically a poor, poor family, but a strong, sturdy family that stuck with me through whatever I, ordeal I came face, face to face with. And at 21 years old, Henry Tillman was one step away from prison when he was sentenced to four years for armed robbery, result of a craps game gone awry. Over the next two and a half years in the Wayward Youth Authority, his attitude changed. During that time, Tillman became a certified welder, earned his general education degree, and learned to box. It's a phase that you go through as a child, uh, being raised around those type of environments. Some eventually grow up, mature, and break away, and some never mature and break away. But Henry did break away, and after only two years of amateur experience, made the 1984 Olympic team. Proving all the skeptics wrong, he twice defeated a teenager named Mike Tyson. They first met in the Olympic trial. Tyson scored a knockdown, but for the most part, Tillman fought intelligently and used his jab and footwork to stay away from Tyson's bombs. All five judges scored the match for the former dead-end kid from L.A. Then one month later at the Olympic box office, this time Tyson was clearly more active, and the older fighter seemed listless There's and detached. Good. Though the scoring was closer, the result remained the same. From Los Angeles, California, in the red corner, Henry Tillman. Some ringside observers felt Tyson had gotten job, but nonetheless, Tillman forged ahead to the Olympics and captured the gold medal four miles from where he had grown up. At the Olympics, Henry also met his bride-to-be, Gina Hemphill, granddaughter of Jesse Owens. She carried the torch into the Coliseum at opening ceremonies. Three years ago, they were married among friends and Olympic teammates. She's my superwoman, because she's, I mean, she had been over backwards for me. I mean, she's even uh, put her own career on hold for a little while, just to support me in my career. A career that started out with promise, but quickly nosedived when Burt Cooper handed Tillman his first pro defeat. Eight months later, Tillman was battered by his Olympic roommate, Evander Holyfield, a loss that many say took an irreversible toll. Over the next 13 months, Henry suffered two more defeats and hit rock bottom. And so I said at that point, I need to just take some time out of boxing before I either get hurt or just ruin my career myself by keep going in there not mentally prepared to compete as a boxer. And so I just stepped out of boxing for a minute. Hit, John, hit. But that minute lasted 20 months. In the interim, he landed a role in the upcoming Rocky V movie, dabbled in the real estate business, spent some time with his family back home in South Central Los Angeles, and most importantly, found himself a new manager, trainer, and friend, a man named Henry Grooms. He said, I would be crazy if I'd let boxing go right now. He said, you're young, you still have a lot of spunk left, a lot of fight left in you. You just need to take a little time off, get your management problems out the way, get your mind clear, go home, spend some time with your wife, get into your family life, and just, just let life move on a little bit, because you're just too young just to let boxing go right now. You've never been hurt, never been knocked out, you know. He said, it just it doesn't make any sense. Maybe life doesn't always make sense. Six years ago, fresh out of the youth authority, Henry Tillman's future as an amateur fighter went through Mike Tyson. He was successful twice and earned the greatest reward imaginable. Tonight, after a long layoff and a resurrected career, Henry Tillman's path to greatness once again leads through Mike Tyson, now the former heavyweight champion. For Henry Tillman to score a hat trick, he'll need to step out of the shadows of anonymity, just like he did in 1984. Now the Olympic heavyweight gold medalist prepares to enter the ring. You see there his professional record, 24 fights included in those five years, one 20-month layoff from the sport. Maybe the neatest and most compact phrase I've heard to size up Henry Tillman was issued by the outstanding 
ABC Sports boxing expert Alex Wallow, who said of Tillman, he has the heart of a warrior, but not the chin of one. Too brave for his own good and his own buddy. Of course, that statement was made about Tillman at a time when he was fighting as a cruiserweight at 190 pounds. He claims that he is much more resilient and steadier now as a 215-pound heavyweight. Similar enough to relive those two amateur losses he gave Mike Tyson, trying to relive those moments of glory. He's a, he's a sweet man who's made something of his life from uh, terrible beginnings. But I'm afraid for this night, he's just a, a frog being fed to a, to a snake. Well, on the bright side, he believes, Larry, that he wrote the blueprint for beating Mike Tyson with his two amateur victories over him, and that Douglas merely stole a page from the script with his Tokyo exploit. A, a lot of people knew the blueprint, having seen those fights, but even uh, this, uh, forgetting the fact that Mike Tyson is a whole lot different fighter than he was as an amateur, uh, it was only Douglas who could execute the blueprint. In 24 fights, Tillman has won 20 times, lost four. He's had 14 knockouts of his own. You heard him say in the profile that he has not been knocked out, but he has indeed been the victim of technical knockouts by journeyman fighters like Dwayne Bonds in addition to outstanding ones like Evander Holyfield. What must Henry Tillman do against Tyson? What must Tyson do to begin regaining his glory? Ray Leonard's tip of the night. Well, when Mike Tyson bobs and weave, he becomes an illusion. That upper body movement allows him to slip, get inside, and to attack his opponents with those devastating combinations. Speed, combinations of power is synonymous with Mike Tyson. He must get me, get aggressive, stay on top of his opponents. Now, with Henry Tillman, Tillman needs to box box get inside throw his punches and get outside stay out of harm's reach don't fight mike tyson that's a mistake too many guys have made other than buster douglas who's successful don't fight him box him use that ring as much as you possibly can and you should be able to turn the tables around and now you see the tyson entourage beginning to emerge from his dressing room one of the new faces there just behind tyson just out of the shot to camera right is Rich Giacchetti, the longtime trainer of Larry Holmes. Tyson's reign of terror over the heavyweight division lasted three years and three months until February 10 stateside, February 11 in Tokyo, when Douglas took the title away. Can't read Tyson's mind here. He doesn't seem quite the eager, uh, intense fellow that he was as a young man, and I guess he shouldn't be. He's not... 18, 19, 20 years old anymore, but I think I see a, a more mature Tyson um, who wants to do take care of whatever business he has tonight. There are some who say, incidentally, that the left eye has never fully mended from the beating it took from Douglas in Tokyo, and as you look at that close-up shot, you can see what appears to be some discoloration under the left eye and some puffiness around the outside of it. Now, Ray Leonard, four months have passed. Is it possible that eye hasn't fully healed from what Buster Douglas did with it? He's had adequate time for that to heal and get back to normal. But I'm sure it depends on the type of training he went through, the type of sparring he went through that made that possible again, the swelling. And there are a lot of question marks about that because writers and reporters were not allowed access to Tyson's training session to anywhere near the degree that has been customary before big fights like this in the past. The real challenge for Mike Tyson will come when some big, strong heavyweight comes along who can fold him up in his arms and try to do the things that Douglas did to him. Then we'll find out whether he wants to be a champion of the 90s as well as he was for a brief time in the 80s. Mike Tyson's record, 37 wins, one loss, 33 knockouts. He started his career with the 19 consecutive knockouts before James Tillis and Mitch Green solved the mystery of how to go 12 full rounds with Tyson. Later, Bone Crusher Smith and Tony Tucker did the same thing. But other than that, it's been all knockouts. And Mostly his, the one by Douglas. There's a look at Rich Giacchetti. Yes, that's the, the new uh, executive trainer in charge of the team. He was really imposed on uh, Tyson. Tyson didn't want him, but uh, finally he agreed to accept him. Steady. 
And there is Eddie Aliano, the new cut man, known as Eddie the Clot Aliano. And of course, that infamous uh, corner treatment that he got in Tokyo, Tyson, uh, this man uh, won't let anything like that happen again. Tail of the tape for Tyson versus Tillman. You can see that Tillman is much the senior of the two and the taller. Tyson weighing in at 217, and he looked very thin for Mike. Smaller in the eyes of many than was the case at 221 or 222. 71 inches reach as opposed to the 81 inches for the much taller Henry Tillman. And our punch stat numbers. Interesting numbers there on what Tyson did in his 10 previous title fights, the activity he had. Uh, a quick reading of that might tell you, well, uh, Mike Tyson wasn't the same against uh, Buster Douglas. My reading of it is, is that Buster Douglas didn't let him throw as many punches. He kept him busy defending Buster Douglas's punches. In any event, there you see uh, Tillman's activity in the two fights that he lost against Holy Phillip and Cooper. And you can see he throws a lot of punches, doesn't land a lot because he's fleeing as he throws. And there you see the jabs. Tillman will have to throw a lot of jabs. But the plain truth is he doesn't have anything, anything to worry Tyson about. Nevada rules again. Three judges scoring on the 10-point must. And once again, the most important rule, if one of the fighters goes down three times in a round, the fight is over. Let's go back up to Chuck Hall. Ladies and gentlemen, the officials are signed for the next bout of the evening by the Nevada State Athletic Commission. The judges will be Chuck Ciampa, Art Lurie, and Dolby Shirley. Your referee is Richard Steele. The next bout of the evening, a co-main event of the night, featuring 10 rounds of boxing in the heavyweight division. Introducing, in the blue corner, fighting out of Los Angeles, California, weighing in at 215 pounds, with a professional record of 20 wins, four defeats with 14 KOs, he was a gold medalist in the 23rd Olympiad in Los Angeles, California. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Henry Tillman. And in the red corner, from Catskill, New York, weighing 217 pounds. His professional record consists of 37 wins, one defeat with 33 KOs. He is a former undisputed Heavyweight champion of the world, Iron Mike Tyson. The two favorite to knock out his opponent in the first round. That means if you wanted to make two dollars, you'd have to bet four dollars. The over-under is two and a half rounds, the lowest I've ever heard of. That means you can bet on whether the fight goes past two and a half rounds or less than two and a half rounds here in Las Vegas. And given the choice of opponents, you have to believe that what the Tyson camp dearly wants for their fighter is one of those 90 seconds on which his destroyer reputation was built. You see what's happening here with Henry Tillman using the ring, using movement. Mike Tyson, I knew he would charge right at Henry Tillman because he doesn't respect Henry Tillman. But in doing so, he may leave himself open because he's trying so hard to impress. You see the right hand by Henry Tillman. Mike Tyson must be aggressive, but he must be careful, not to rush in there. Now, question, how much does that remind Tyson of the overhead right that Buster Douglas kept stuffing into his mouth in Tokyo? Every time that Tillman lands a punch, it reminds him, it brings back that memory. Mike Tyson is a man with conviction. He wants to be impressive. He wants to impress not only himself, but to the princes say, Mike Tyson's beaten soundly by Buster Douglas. Tillman's idea, move, box, jab, fast combinations, give Tyson angles. All very well and good. What happens when he gets hit? That right hand of Tillman needs to be close to that chin. You notice where he drops it. Pure off, he drops it. Now, Jim, he's doing the right thing, Tillman is. When Tyson comes inside, if he's not going to punch, tie him up. Break his rhythm. Solid right hand by Tyson to the body. Tillman staggers backward. Mike goes at him, and Tillman grabs and holds on. I believe Tillman's going to stand there and try to drop his right hand because he's trying to time Mike Tyson's onslaught. 
Not that much movement from Tillman now. Tillman missed with an overhand right. Trying exactly as you said he would to drop it in. Right to the face of Tillman. He grabs and holds on. That one was a bit of a glancing blow. On the fallen fighter, who probably needs a little air. It was a right hand in close quarters to the forehead, and it was quite enough. The snake always devours the frog. My over-under was 90 seconds. I think it went over. <laughs> yeah, I think there are a lot of people who are probably surprised by how far it went. Henry Tillman is not known to take a punch very well. He took one really solid blow earlier in the round, and a vicious shot to the body, and finally it was that right to the forehead that was enough. The question, I, the question I have as we watch, as we watch this again, and there is the punch, a high punch on the forehead, the same the sort of a punch that knocked out Trevor Burbick when Mike Tyson won the heavyweight championship. The question I have is whether you can sell another doubleheader like this with a combined six or seven minutes of fighting. Well, if it's Francesco Damiani and Alex Stewart, as appears to be the case in September, those are fighters with better credentials than those of Adelson Rodriguez and Henry Tillman. This is true, but uh, I'm just curious. I don't know whether you can. I'm not saying you can't sell it. I'm just asking whether you can. We came here for a two-ring circus, and we got it. <laughs> One more look at the Hail Mary right hand. I know I'm going to land it somewhere here. And Tillman never responded at all to Richard Steele's count. And now let's go up to Chuck Hall for the official announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, the time, two minutes, 47 seconds of the first round. The winner by a knockout, Iron Mike Tyson. So, referee Richard Steele raises the hand of Mike Tyson. There's Rich Giacchetti. A very successful debut for Rich Giacchetti. And here you see the total punches in the round. Tillman landed four. Tyson, 14, according to our statisticians. Not that, not that it makes any difference. If there was any doubt going into this fight, and there wasn't, Tillman landed a hard, clean right, right on the button of Tyson. Early in the round, Tyson barely blinked. There's the big crowd standing around. It's been a curious crowd. I think the crowd knew what it was coming for, which was a show, a circus as we've been calling it. There wasn't a lot of high excitement about it, just a lot of high curiosity. Uh, to see two former champions performing. Go through it one more time. Left jab, bang. Right over the right jab. Perfect shot by Mike Tyson. Once again, Henry Tillman, too brave for his chin. Now to you, Jim. All right, Mike Tyson has joined us now at ringside. Mike, a lot of people thought that maybe you had some questions to answer for yourself tonight. Were there questions in your mind, and if so, did you answer them? No, I didn't, I didn't have much doubt on the situation, the outcome of the fight. It's just that um, I was skeptical because I didn't give my best performance. You know what I mean? I had no idea that. I knew I was always the same person still. It's just that I was reluctant in the situation, and I wasn't professional, and that's not um, characteristic of me. How that. good did this performance feel for you? Well, it helps, you know, you come back, you got your win. It helps the confidence, but I, I want to fight often as I possibly can. 
how much can you learn from two minutes and 47 seconds? There are some who would contend that maybe you should have taken a tougher opponent and stayed in the ring longer. Well, as you know, like, as Ray knows. Anything else, Ray? Congratulations, Mike. Thank you, Ray. Congratulations, Mike. I should point out that Mike put Ray and me in a little bit of an awkward position tonight because he preferred to be interviewed by us rather than by Larry Merchant, whose custom it would have been to do that interview. Mike made his own choice about that. We didn't feel all that great about doing it. We did our job so that you could hear Mike's reaction to what happened in the bout. Your reaction to what Mike said in the interview, if you heard it. Civilization rolls on. I thought his reaction was good. I thought the fight he fought was good. He did what he had to do against an opponent he figured to do it against, <laughs> basically. Um, we got what we what we expected to get tonight. It's as, it's as simple as that. I thought that the both fights wouldn't last more than a combined total of nine minutes, and we didn't get it. And um, uh, the people here, uh, I don't think they can be unhappy because uh, they can't say they weren't warned. <laughs> Indeed, obviously, Ray, there was tremendous public interest in what happened here tonight. Certainly, it would appear that way from the nature of the turnout here. How many big stars took the effort to come to this fight? Uh, the kind of ticket demand that existed here at Caesars. But once again, you've had a one-round Tyson knockout, and uh, it was a series of events like that which caused promoters and site uh, guarantors here in the United States to begin to think that maybe it wasn't worth putting up all the money that Mike gets for a fight to have him fight here, and that's how he wound up fighting Buster Douglas in Tokyo. Is the public going to stay as interested in September after what they saw from Tyson and Foreman tonight? Well, the thing about it, Tyson of the past has always knocked guys out in one or two rounds. People came to see Tyson demolish a guy in one or two rounds, and because he was knocked out by Buster Douglas, they thought that that uh, aura was gone. He revived it by beating uh, uh, Henry Tillman, and then George Foreman, who comes back at the age of 41 and was able to do what the average man of 41 could never do in their lifetime. Final comments, Larry? Yeah, I've been uh, thinking of our interview with uh, Adelson Rodriguez uh, the other day when he told us a, uh, a very funny uh, man bites dog story. <laughs> Seems he came back from uh, two, two months on the road and the guard dog didn't recognize him and bit him in the thigh and Rodriguez strangled the dog, bit the dog, killed him, then shot him just to make sure. And uh, so uh, there was a little doubt in my mind. I'm saying, well, are we going to get a uh, man bites dog <laughs> shot tonight? No, nope. dog bites man twice. Um, I'm curious about Mike Tyson in this sense. You know, for a lot of people, Mike Tyson was a hero. Young people, he was going to be their great heavyweight champion, much as Joe Lewis was and Jack Dempsey was and Muhammad Ali was. So those people were really shook up when Mike Tyson lost. Whatever we want to say about his character and personality and the antics in and out of the ring and all of that, they were shook up. And I, I assume that there's still a residue of hope here that Mike Tyson will come back and will still be their champion and that the defeat somehow humanizes and humbles him a bit. And uh, I expect to see that. All right, that remains to be seen in the future. As for wrapping up tonight's story, as Larry pointed out, the simplest and most predictable of tales, man not bitten by dog, dog bites man. George Foreman goes to 67 and two with the second round knockout of Rodriguez. Mike Tyson moves to 38 and one with the first round knockout of Tillman. A look back. His hands are so heavy that what becomes a knockout punch doesn't always look like one and Rodriguez goes down. trying to fight Mike Tyson. He should be doing a lot more movement than he is now. He's allowing Mike Tyson to trap him in the corner. That'll be enough. Surprise! Coming up, immediately following tonight's boxing coverage, you'll see one night stand, Rich Scheidner, followed by Ghostbusters 2 on the East Coast, and How I Got Into College on the West Coast. All of these programs will be seen in their entirety. And be sure to join HBO Sports in London, England for Wimbledon 1990. We'll take you from the first day of play Monday, June 25, right through the men's semifinals. We'll also have a special highlight show on July 9, looking back at the entire tournament. So join us for unprecedented coverage of tennis's most prestigious event, beginning Monday, June 25, right here on HBO. 
And now for Larry Merchant and Sugar Ray Leonard, I'm Jim Lapley saying so long from Las Vegas, Nevada. The executive producer of HBO Sports and the producer of tonight's telecast was Ross Greenberg. This heavyweight doubleheader was directed by Mark Payton. The replay producer was Rick Bernstein. The feature producers, David Harmon and Brian McDonald. The assistants to the producer, Kendall Reed and Kirby Bradley. Production manager, Russell Gabay. And the technical supervisor was George Wenzel. of HBO Sports, the network of champions.